and I got a loading bar. I think it says on Zoom, it says we're live though, doesn't it? Yeah, I think the audio is picked up, says Aaron um, from the beginning. Okay. Um, there is a squeaking happening. Do you have a, a mouse or a bird? That is my dog. Oh, oh poor pup. Yeah, he's not excited to not be hanging out with me. Oh, buddy. Well, if you want to let your furry buddy join the call, then please. I mean, it'll be a lot of like, Nimbus, stop doing that, if you don't mind that. <laughs> sure, yeah. No, it, makes, it keeps it exciting. It keeps it spontaneous. Okay, then, then I'll come get him. You've been invited, Nimbus. Well, while Rochelle is getting their pup, uh, hi, everybody. Jesse Hool here. We're doing another of our kitchen table chats. This is the seventh one in an erratic series uh, where we talk about local politics and other things in our lives, the intersection of the personal and the political. Today, I am joined by Rochelle Berry, who will be back with Pup in Hand momentarily. And we thought that we'd dig in today into some more like general concepts of socialism, feminism, and abolition, and then maybe dig into how those things relate to the things that we want to see happen on the local level, of course, with me running for commission, as well as more broadly in our world. And uh, of course, anything else that you all want to share as questions or thoughts to steer us in whatever direction this may go. So Rochelle, do you want to take a minute to introduce yourself and the pupper? Yes. Hello, everyone. I'm Rochelle. Um, this is my dog, Nimbus. Nimbus, ow, look at the camera. Well, that's that's close enough. Okay, this is Nimbus. Yeah, if you hear me yelling at somebody, it's it's definitely him. Awesome. Um, and silently joining us today from the other room is Celia. So if you see a comment on the live chat from the account Jesse for Athens, that is Celia. And Celia, I can't see the stream on my phone. So I guess if someone asks a question, could you just like pass me a post-it? Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Celia is a, is a silent hero today. Uh, the silent hero many days lurking in the background of our Nimbus, social media. No. <laughs> um, yeah. So Nimbus is named after the cloud type Nimbus, mm -hmm. that, but then also for short is NIMBY. Yeah. Do you, do you want to share a, a, a little bit about why that was so wonderful for you? I mean, he, I think he just looks like a cloud. He's got like really creamy color. And does he does he bring the storm? Uh, all the time. Oh yeah, I forgot I told you that he's like a cloud of doom. Yeah. I said something like that earlier on. When he was a puppy, he just like chewed on everything and was just like, he has endless energy, which is great because I'm like a really lazy person. So it makes me like get outside every day. But mm -hmm. like in when I say endless, I mean like the day he got like, um neutered he was he was like bouncing off the walls like that like that same day after that same, no when i went to pick him up he was just like wow to go you know, run laps and like i think one day he got like uh what's it called um he'd gotten his shots and he had gotten um like the stuff that makes you really sleepy the um benadryl was wide awake just like ready to again run laps like he has endless energy so but puppies with endless energy and drive are, are notoriously harder to deal with he just ate my blueberries as well <laughs> yeah. just, 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 blueberry. they're his now clearly um so yesterday when we were discussing what we might want to talk about today uh, and you had thrown out there that like socialism could be the, the theme, maybe. Um, we got talking a bit about the strategy that's currently employed around that idea of socialism in the US, which is usually associated with the DSA for most people, right? The Democratic Socialists mm -hmm. of America and Bernie's campaign and things. Um, so do you want to maybe kind of pick up that conversation here? I remember us being like, we could dig into this now, but let's save it, so. Yeah, so I had said that, um... 
I was thinking about like the DSA strategy and how it's not one that I subscribe to, but it clearly has worked. Um, so as I understand it, the DSA, the DSA strategy is to have a separate organization from the Democratic Party, but push their candidates to primary, uh, um, uh, like long, long time candidates and to endorse and to like push for progressive policies to be within the the uh, Democratic Party, which is like moving the the Overton window, like with the um, Green New Deal and Medicare for all, like those mm -hmm. those kinds of progressive ideas, as like a way to push socialist policy. Mm -hmm. And so, what about that? Did you disagree with? Well, just that, like as we, I don't think that we have an well. If we look at the DSA, like their organizing is very focused on the Democratic Party. So I mean, it's only every every two every election. They're fo they're very focused on elections, um, less on on like worker organizing or, or uh, political education during the off years of the election. Or they're um, I don't know how much they organized locally for local elections. Um, mm -hmm. I've mostly only seen them really get involved as an organization at the federal level. Mm -hmm. So um, those would be my, my biggest concerns is that like, I mean, how is the organizing being carried on after the election? Mm -hmm. And is the organizing being encompassed by the election? itself and that the democratic party is just like no place for socialism like they're economic liberals and they're committed as shown in recent weeks yeah um yeah so I, i'm curious are you basing that on like what you've seen with dsa chapters here or also you know you've lived other places before you moved to georgia so is that also what you saw like in california and Tennessee? Or? um i'm like new to understanding the DSA. So this is based on just like from 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 like what I've seen of them. So okay. um yeah it's been interesting in like watching the DSA get more of a foothold in the South and, and how that's playing out. And there is a fair amount of autonomy chapter to chapter. And so what I've noticed is in the, the Athens chapter that's kind of had a, a false start a couple times and now seems to be going although there's kind of this period i think of like we'll see where it heads now that bernie dropped out i think a lot of momentum was lost there but i do know that some of the organizers still want to push forward um but there's been this question that's been debated within folks in that group i think from the get of how much to dig into electoral politics beyond bernie um Whereas in other chapters around the country, I think of like Oakland as one of the ones I tend to keep up with the best because I have a couple friends who live out there and talk about what they're doing, but also because they've had a lot of successes at winning local level political races, as well as fighting for policies that they've actually gotten like their, their city council to pass. Um, so they've functioned a lot more how Athens for Everyone was functioning here for a while. Um, and I remember, so my first <clears throat> introduction to the DSA in person was in 2014. A few of us went up to their national conference in New York and learned some things that became like very founding principles for how we organized Tim's campaign for mayor and then like the, the kind of foundation we laid for the infrastructure of Athens for everyone. Um, but at the time, you know, there's there's actually a debate of like whether we should try to start a DSA chapter or not. And the decision not to, as I recall, um, and if someone else gets on here and wants to color this as something else, please do. Um, but uh, as I recall, <clears throat> it was basically like two reasons that we did it. One was that the DSA didn't really have a presence in the South. Um, they were in a few major cities. There was an Atlanta chapter, um, but to really start a whole new chapter in smaller areas like Athens felt very much like we'd be disconnected from the, the broader organization of DSA who, who wasn't really seeing things through a southern lens like one of the things that we really noticed was absent from the discussions when we were in new york was a conversation around race which of course isn't 
like only happening in the South, thankfully anymore. Um, but I, I definitely see, at least in my experience, it seems like that conversation has been advanced a lot more by organizing in the South um, and, and like organizations from around the country taking um, like Black Lives Matter and other organizing happening in the South more seriously and like meaningfully integrating that into their organizations. <clears throat> and so like now there's DSA chapters all over the South where there wasn't before. And they finally had a national conference in the South um, a couple of years ago for the first time. So it's interesting to think like, would an organization like Athens for Everyone have been started as a specific to Athens organization or would we have just been a DSA chapter if we were starting it now? Like, I don't know. Um, but I tend to think that there like is room for a DSA chapter to start here and that there is value in doing that kind of like infiltration of democratic primaries to get people who are left of the democratic party. Um, of course it remains to be seen how well that's going to work elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious like what informs that suspicion beyond the obvious, like we've seen the, on the federal level, on the executive level, you know, the democratic party has kind of cherry picked their candidate a couple times in a row now at the expense of not only socialist candidates, but even like a lot of those ideas being brought into the platform, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think as an organization that they're, they've, they've been successful and great at like pushing, um, pushing their candidates and, and um, getting them elected, but just getting elected doesn't mean they have power. I mean, if I, if we think about like the squad or whomever who like represent like the DSA's values, I'm not sure if they were like endorsed by the DSA. Exactly, but um, on the like broader scale of moving from what we have now to a socialist economy uh, and like society, I don't think like DSA's method is gonna work. As an organization, I think they're, they're the most successful people on the left mm -hmm. at this moment. Um, so that's what I mean by like, we need worker organization and like not um, organizing that's not captured by elections, not that DSA as an organization isn't successful. I think they've been one of the most successful mm -hmm. organizations on the left, but I think like a broader kind of like movement of people pushing socialism in, um, in the US, like we need more people working outside of elections than in them. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, my dog is just eating up all of these blueberries. <laughs> well, they're all gone. It's fine. Like, like, I don't know what a serving of blueberries looks like for a dog, but um, probably not the same as mine. All right, that's enough. That's enough. <laughs> yeah, but like I was saying, um, uh, yeah, I just think that there needs to be a movement of people who are not captured by elections, who are pushing socialism, um, that are organizing workers. Mm -hmm. And that's that's just not what the DSA is doing. But yeah, I, I, I'd be curious if we heard from people who had like experience in places where the where a DSA chapter is more robust, like how that's played mm -hmm. out. Because my understanding is that there is more of that happening in some of the cities where there's not only a larger population generally, but like a much larger chapter. Mm -hmm. um, and it, so they'll have like working groups that are organizing around specific issues to push that. Um, but there is this tendency, I think, for organizations that do electoral work to absorb a lot of that energy into electoral causes. And because elections are happening so constantly and on these cycles of two and four years and sometimes special elections, um, I know that's what I've experienced happening here in Athens with a lot of organizations, especially Athens for Everyone, where like the electoral cycle really um, dictates a lot of how things are um, prioritized. And I guess that leads to me wondering, like, do you think that you talk about kind of this inside outside strategy where we need more people on the outside, more people you know, outside of the electoral system pushing for change, and then people who have that formal power kind of follow suit by some combination of getting elected because the popular will is there or being pressured by the popular will outside their institution. Mm -hmm. um, how do you imagine that like we organize best to achieve those things? If we're doing that inside outside strategy, like do you imagine it being a separate 
series of organizations or sort of a more amorphous like waving the banner of socialism and having kind of like these emergent protests and um, working groups or how do, how do you think that plays out? Um, I think that I think that we need democracy at work. I haven't read the book yet, but um, I've followed the argument and have bought the book. It's sitting over here with the rest of the books I have to read um, by Andrew Wolf. Um, he's an economist who basically is um, talking, he, in his book, he talks about how like the US is an oligarchy, right? Like, and that, that uh, workplaces are the least democratic places in the US. And that um, if we want to change, if we want socialism, we have to start in the workplace. Because, um, I mean, and that's really what socialism is about, if we could step backwards a little bit. Like when we think about socialism, people want to think about like the vanguard and the Soviet Union and like these state state socialist um, or what is it called? State run economies like, and like that, I mean, for good reason, people want to think about socialism as that because those were socialist um, experiments. But if we go back to the text that produces socialism, Marx or uh, capital, capital isn't about states. It's not about governing, it's about work. Mm -hmm. And it's about who, who, how value is produced in the society and um, money, capital and rent and economies and all that. So to produce socialism, you have to, you have to do that through the value you're producing in a society, which right now we do at work in our, in our economy. And so like, I think that to push for socialism, we have to unionize and not unionize only to validate this relationship of, we have to demand things from the, um, from the boss in order to get them, but in order to take over these businesses so that the workers can control the value that they produce. And so that so workers won't, using, what? So like using like union organizing and workplace organizing to then essentially like work towards a cooperative model and have more yeah. like worker, worker owned yeah. co-ops that are, that are managing the mm -hmm. whole deal. Yes. Um, so I'm curious what you think the role of a state or local government is in that, right? Because we have, I mean, a fair amount has changed since Marx was on the planet, right? Mm -hmm. Certainly when we think of like how capitalism has evolved to be what it is. Um, so uh, w like what role do you think institutions that already exist, state institutions, as well as maybe local governments play in advancing this cause? Like, do you see them as barriers or places to also further the cause or a mix of the two? I mean, I think right now, especially in Georgia, they're barriers because state employees don't have the ability to unionize with, um, um, by vote. You, you can always, like UGA has a union, the, or the Georgia, what's it called? University, U, the USG has a union, United Campus Workers of Georgia, but we don't have the like same rights of unionizing as places, other places because of right to work. So I think what um, local, they're gone. All the blueberries are gone. Okay, they're gone. Sorry. Um, we Like what, I think what, <laughs> what politicians, <laughs> can do is they can um they can like fight against right to work laws they can um help they can start workers um uh what what are we pushing for now i'm i need to like wake all the way up um a worker, worker center, center. Yeah. worker centers they can they can provide the capital for um for businesses to change hands from from owners to cooperatives 
Um, yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunity, especially when we're moving into a great depression, like as, um, like as these businesses close up, fail, go bankrupt, like there is capital that's very cheap right now that can be um, gotten to buy these businesses up. Like there are very few businesses where the workers are not able to work without the person at the top um, running things. Um, so I would say there's a lot of opportunity to move forward into that there just has to be organizing and people who want to, who are going to make it happen. And I'm curious, do you think that in the workplace, there's kind of this idea of like democratize your existing workplace versus starting businesses that are cooperative mm -hmm. from the get, you know, from the ground up. Um, and I'm guessing you and I probably agree that like, of course we need both, but if you think of like where to, focus energy and I think specifically where um, I, I guess I'm super curious you know somebody's running for commission if you're thinking of like where the local government can focus their energy you know we have a couple of DSA members who are already on the commission and then the potential to get a couple more on there this mm -hmm. go around so if we're to kind of push for this um, socialist approach to labor um, in local policy do you think you know, here and make it as specific as you want, whether it's like in the context of Georgia where there's different limitations and generally, or if you want to kind of just be generally what you imagine is a good strategy um, for people working on the local level. Um, do you think that supporting union organizing to de democratize existing workplaces, these large institutions, which in Athens would be like the university and the hospitals, um, as well as the county government, um, do you think that's the way to go? Or do you think that like trying to incubate worker owned co-ops, you know, we hear a lot about like investment in entrepreneurship as like a tendency for local government to focus its resources. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm curious your thoughts on, on how much of each of those is the role of a local government. I mean, I think that the local government here, um, what people have been asking for is for a worker center and um, that is staffed by um, an organizer who knows how to start a union, who can help with unemployment claims, who can, um, who will um, work with people to apply for jobs and um, get lost pay. Um, so I think that that is um, one, just like following the, the demands that have made from the, um, from, from the people in Athens. Um, I think also on the, on the state level, getting rid of all the anti-worker laws that are these BS right to work um, sets of laws and allowing for public employees to be able to unionize. Um, let's see what else is there. And then just providing like, you know, if, if, so um, Economic Justice Coalition has been doing this for a while now that they've been um, getting funds and then finding entrepreneurs who wanna own businesses to start cooperatives. And so if, the, if Athens is really serious about um, getting you know, a prosperity, then having workers have more control over their wages and their work and supporting entrepreneurs like cooperatives are this way forward where we don't have just another entrepreneur who pays their workers as little as possible um, that could be provided grants or money or capital or space to work in. So that brings to mind for me and yeah Celia have you seen any questions or comments? Okay, you want to just text me? Okay. Um, so I'll get to that in a second here. But I, I guess I'm, so I think of Patrick Davenport, who's on our commission and, you know, worked with the EJC for a long time and, and helped start the Peachy Green Cleaning Cooperative. Um, and, and, you know, unless something's changed for Patrick more recently, I can't speak for him, he's not here. But I remember him 
not identifying as a socialist. You know, he liked a lot of our ideas, those of us who worked with him on a lot of stuff, but he really thought of himself as like a Democrat. Um, and he felt comfortable with like progressive. Um, I'm curious your thoughts on like how important is the word socialism? You know, like how important is it for us to be explicitly using that terminology and, and to advance these causes? And, you know, you hear a lot of arguments from people that like that can get in the way of us advancing the cause because you lose people who just sort of balk at the, the, the concept from the get. Um, but then the counter argument to that is like we need to build more of a like social acceptance of that idea again and more of a momentum behind it so that we can rally behind the bigger changes that we need so we're not just trying to start a co-op here and there but that we're actually getting those like massive changes on the state and federal level so mm -hmm. i'm curious your your thoughts on that too like how important is it to push the the word or the brand if you will of socialism I think it's really important. I, if we can see that what happened in this last election, like the red baiting was so strong. And to me, I was like, they're going to talk about Cuba. That's not going to work. And then I was like, oh, wow, that really worked. Like, just like getting Bernie Sanders to say nice things about um, an anti-imperialist tiny country in the Caribbean. Um, that has done good and bad things is like so effective because of the level of red baiting that has been done in the US. And like, I think that like there is, I mean, I think uh, I've watched a ton of his lectures now. Richard Wolf always starts his lectures with just trying to be like, you don't know what socialism is because of this country, like, literally, like socialism equals bad is like the last 50 years of rhetoric on like oh this is socialist and it's like no that's just that's just state investment that's not socialism so i think it's important <laughs> to use the word socialism so that it's not like this dirty word of like all the things that are like bad on the left um yeah although i, I do kind of think of like Socialism at the core is like trying to do good for all using a, a, an institutional apparatus such as this if state socialism would be for the state or like such as your workplace and like an industrial approach. Um, that there are these examples of like, well, that is just the state investment. I've always thought of it as like useful to say like our highway system is socialist, you know, our fire departments are socialists and sort of like extrapolate that out as like a parallel to what we want to see happen with other resource production and distribution do you see that as like counterproductive because it kind of misses the deeper point by making making that seem the same or or did i misunderstand what you're saying about richard wolf's framing no i would say i've i've done that as well um i would say like the context does matter um there's a difference between the welfare state and um like there, there's a difference between the welfare state and socialism. So having, you know, free ro roads in a capitalist economy is more, in my understanding, a, uh, a, so a socialist, or is not, is not socialist, it's just a capitalist economy where, where like the state has invested in the roads. But like, to me, like socialism is the, is when the workers own the means of production. And so the roads are part of the means of production. Like if you can't ship your goods to, you know, the person who's going to buy them at the store, um, then like you're, and if that's owned by a private company that you have to pay to use, right? That's a, that's a capitalist mode of, of, of distributing that particular piece of production and so the fact that we have roads that are um collectively paid for through taxes and then distributed all over the country um to me that's not in the broader scheme that's not socialist especially because in georgia those were built through chain gang labor mm -hmm. um as well they're as they're still maintained through that, right? And they're, and they're, they're still, still maintained right? by yeah. prisoner. Yeah, they're still maintained by people 
who are prisoners of the state. Um, so, yeah, so I think, so I think we have to like, look at like, yes, when you're talking to someone who doesn't understand what socialism is, like talking about these like investment, the, you know, the fact that you don't have to pay for these things is like, could, can be seen as socialist, but I think in the broader context, we need to understand like what a welfare state looks like versus what a socialist state looks like. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's a really, really important distinction. So thanks for taking the time to really, really um, lay that out. Um, Ovita Thornton, another of our commissioners, has a oh, question yeah. for us. Um, and Ovita asks, I would like to hear, how do you guard against corruption in unions, like some unions in past history? So, you know, a bit ago when we were talking about unions. Um, I, I guess I'll let you take that first, and then I, I have a couple of thoughts on that too, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm not really an expert on unions. Um, I've only tried starting them, not really have had the, um, the, the, run, I haven't had the ability to run one, which I wish, mm -hmm. you know, that Georgia State would give me that opportunity. Um, uh, but I would say that there's good and bad unions, like just like, you know, like just because I think that unionizing is, <laughs> will you shut it? <laughs> just because I think unionizing is a path forward into socialism doesn't mean that like all unions like have done the right thing or have worked properly. I've, as I've read their unions were, some unions were segregated and they would like in Detroit and they would um, every other, you know, election term, the black folks would run the union or the white people would run the union. And there were, there's been unions where the managers were allowed to um, be in charge of the union and they would make sure like that, um, they did like they didn't always get everything that they needed, and there are unions today that don't allow striking um, unless unless they are um, uh, allowed by the greater union, as we can see in the UC schools. And mm -hmm. I, I, it's like you're you're cutting your union at the you're cutting your union members at the knees if they're not allowed to decide when they need to strike and when the you know the 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 higher level management is the ones who decide when you're able to mm -hmm. um yeah so i think what this speaks to for me is this idea that like unions don't exist somehow in this like purer context than the rest of the society that they're built in and the people who make up their membership and so really like the tool of unionizing much like the tool of a cooperative um, or the tool of like government regulation are all things that can be used to advance what we might broadly refer to as like justice um, but they can also be co-opted by the existing institutions or the existing like social norms that um, as you put it like kneecap the the what, what we might think of as like the kind of core purpose of having a union in the first place. Um, so I, maybe to kick back like a follow up on this to you and Celia, uh, if, if Ovita follows up, can you please let me know? Um, so Ovita, if you have more that you want to follow up to, please share. Um, also, Marcus Piazza says, checking in from Mass, keep up the good work. Thanks, Marcus. Um, and was replying to this discussion, I think, with um, internal promotion and hires seem to be key in helping keep a level playing field. Knowing your voice matters, matters. Um, so I, I wonder if Marcus, if you could elaborate on like, do you mean in terms of within a union that internal promotion and hires seem to be key or just in the workplace in general for, for building? Uh, I, I, I'd be curious to learn a bit more about what Marcus means by that. Uh, but when I um, when I think of like so how the obvious question is like how do we guard against that corruption right like sort of acknowledging that that can happen what can we do to to guard against it uh, and I'm curious your thoughts Rochelle on like what role again like the local government can play you know here we have 
a commissioner in the thread, which is awesome. Thank you for joining, Ovita. And, uh, and and I'm running for commission. And I'd really like to know like what your thoughts are on what we can do to not only like give space for workers to organize, say, in a worker center, but like to really um, promote the idea that we have unions that are functioning in a just fashion, and creating that accountability. And who's responsible mm -hmm. for that accountability, I guess, is another question. Um, well, I, like I said, I'm not, um, I haven't had the ability to be or run a union. So I'd say I don't, I don't really know um, how, how to stop corruption in a union. I think that um, the, if I understand um, corruption, how corruption is built is that power is um, coalesced in uh, too narrowly um and not like spread out so that people can have local decisions my dog has to go to the bathroom so um do you mind if we pause and i'll be right back sure yeah all right we're gonna take a puppy pause <laughs> um i might take a second to to share a couple thoughts with some things i'm seeing in the thread and i might also take a second to see if i can figure out how to see this myself so i'm not having uh celia shuttle them to me so we are yeah, still I here. Able, and, I was and, able to pull it up on my phone and I, I saw the questions. Oh, you were? Okay. Um, did you pull that up? Maybe it's because I'm hosting it that I'm not seeing it. Mm, I just went to the Jesse for Athens page. Oh, that, that page. Yep. There's also that page. There's so many pages. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll be right all right. See you in a minute. Um, all right. Thanks everybody for bearing with us. I think what part of what's fun about these kitchen table chats is they are just very like ordinary, like we're in our house and sometimes puppies have to pee. Um, sometimes humans have to pee too. I feel like I, I've lucked out that I haven't like really had to pee while one of these is happening. Come on, um, Okay, yeah, I see that. Uh, I can see it now. Cool. Um, Good boy. So, uh, Okay. okay, so I also like Marcus, you were saying that you're in a union too. So, uh, so thank you for sharing as a member of a union, um, your thoughts. Uh, and then Joey um, is saying, in addition to Marcus's suggestion, constant political education about workers' rights and education about what unions are and the roles they serve. This is what UCWGA, that's the University of Georgia's union, for those of you who don't know. Um, has been doing, it's United Campus Workers of Georgia, um, and there's a chapter uh, here in Athens with, U, with UGA. Um, it's what UCWGA has been doing since the beginning. Um, part of that political education involves aggressive anti-racism work too, for reasons Rochelle already mentioned. Um, so yeah, I would love to hear more thoughts from you all in this thread, Ovita, Marcus, and Joey, if you want to share um, about what you think the local government's role is in um, helping not only promote unions and provide space for workers to organize, um, but I, I'm also curious your thoughts on moving union energy towards more cooperative ownership of workplaces. And then also finally, what the government, especially a local government's role would be in um, assisting in that work. Um, Marcus does say agreed resources are bountiful and wanted, no experience with a co-op. Research imminence, all right, cool. Um, and Aaron asks if I can, if we can explain more about what worker co-ops are and when you have those, um, does that negate the necessity for unions? Ooh, that's a fascinating question. Um, so, you know, the basic idea of a co-op is that, I mean, you hear about different cooperatives, daily co-op is a grocery in town that I think is pretty well known. Um, and it's actually owned by, uh, like owner members who shop there. Um, which is not the same as a worker owned co-op, which is where you have a workplace where it's everyone who's employed there, uh, makes the decisions. So there's different cooperative models for businesses. And I personally think the best is a worker owned co-op. I think there's, um, pretty good argument for like consumer owned co-ops where workers get de facto membership. I would love to see daily move more in that direction. Um, and I've worked with different people over the years at daily who have tried to build in like more worker involvement in the decision-making structure. Uh, but usually essentially what you end up with is a board, not unlike a nonprofit or say 
a commission in the government where there's kind of a delegation of people who are empowered to make decisions about the direction of the business. Um, and that can include uh, a narrow array of things like only um, kind of the, the grunt work of handling paperwork and filing taxes and things, or it can include uh, all the decisions, including what HR policies are advanced and how those HR policies are enforced and uh, what raises look like and who gets them. Um, and so there's, in, you know, in my experience, kind of a wide array of cooperative models, which uh, can vary greatly just depending on the people involved. But for worker owned co-ops specifically, uh, the basic idea is everyone who works there has a vote. Sometimes there's variance in, in um, who gets a vote, like you need to have worked there a certain amount of time before you get a vote, or maybe people with seniority have uh, more voting power in some fashion, whether it's about more things or their say counts more. Um, but the most common model I think I've seen is that um, you enter a worker-owned co-op as an employee, and then after a given amount of time, usually between three and 12 months, I tend to like the shorter amount of time better, um, you become a voting owner member. And then you, just like everyone else who works there, regardless of their position, whether they're in a role of like management or HR, or they're in a role of more like um, entry level work, that they're still empowered to decide the direction of the org. And that gives them decision, uh, ideally, I think about uh, how the entirety of the business is run, including and most importantly, the revenue that's generated. So when profits are made, instead of those profits going to a single owner, which is a typical business in the United States, those profits go to the uh, collective ownership and then are shared however that collective ownership sees fit, which is usually a mix of like everyone gets a raise or a bonus and reinvesting into the business. Um, so I guess the, the very short summary version, and, and please follow up Aaron or anyone else if you feel like I didn't answer this well or left something out or you have something to add or ask about. But so the very short version is a worker-owned co-op um, just takes the existing business structure we're all accustomed to. And instead of having a single owner or maybe an owner with a board of investors that uh, benefits from all the profits, but also takes the risk, uh, everybody who works there uh, benefits from all the profits and shares the risk. Um, so. Uh, welcome back, Rochelle. Hello. Good pee? Uh, yep. Awesome. Thanks. Um, Aaron had asked uh, while you were away to explain more about what worker co-ops are. Um, and then there was a follow-up question built into her question, which is, and when we have those, does it negate the necessity for unions? Um, so would you like to take that question? Um, I would hope so. Yeah, I would. I would hope that that a worker co-op is like the, the like ultimate union. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of how I think of it too. Um, and it's been interesting talking with different people, including people we work with and organize with in Athens who don't necessarily agree with that. Um, <laughs> but um, I'll, I'll avoid calling them out unless right, they yeah. pop on this thread and, and want to be here to, to argue their points themselves. But um, uh yeah, I totally agree. I think of like, you form a union to try to win power and the ultimate power is that you have shared decision-making power and shared risk, right? But like a shared mm -hmm. collective ownership of the whole deal. Um, I think one of the, the most disappointing things to me about labor organizing in the US and the direction unions have uh, gone after, you know, the height of unions is like early 20th century, right? And that's when we got like actual regulations on the workplace, you know, uh, a limit to how many days you could work, how many hours you could work without overtime. And we got the weekends and we got, you know, we won things like paid vacation and, and maternity leave and stuff. A lot of that's been eroded or hasn't been fully realized, but um, didn't exist at all until unions were organizing. Um, but there was generally in most of these situations, unions organizing against an owner class and rarely were, were unions in the US taking over mm -hmm. um, their, their, their workplaces, whether those workplaces were mines and industrial settings and factories or you know agricultural settings and farms. Um, 
or you know what a lot of our economy has moved to more recently are like office spaces and groceries and service work. You know, a lot of the, the industry that unions were founded around has also moved overseas, which I think is, you know, perhaps related to, well, avoiding all that explanation. Uh, yeah, I agree that we would ideally see unions in their fully realized form become a cooperative and essentially a cooperative just is a union that doesn't have an owner to reckon with anymore. Mm -hmm. to negotiate with because you're all just negotiating with each other on a level playing field um and does that kind of match your thought too yeah so i guess the follow-up question that seems natural to me is how do we actually make that happen <laughs> right if you start a co-op that's worker owned it's kind of obvious you just hopefully continue to find a way to keep it that way and you hopefully continue to find a way to keep people who have um higher levels in the union, you know, in check and everyone's still working collaboratively. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about these existing businesses, you know, whether it's a restaurant with an owner and 10 employees or a, a major employer like Caterpillar or Certainty, you know, these big industries in town or a, or a super employer like the University of Georgia, um, in all those scenarios, you're there's generally an antagonism built into even the idea of forming a union. Um, yeah. And a lot of how it's written about is that there's like a seizing of the means of production. There's like a taking. Um, and I think, you know, there's a kind of a more utopian idea that we can sort of peacefully transition. Uh, <laughs> although I do wonder, you know, if and how that might even be possible. But I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on that. You mentioned that this, in these times we're seeing a strain that might be an opportunity to capitalize upon. What do you imagine that could look like? I think as businesses go belly up that they can be bought with state funds and and preserved and given to the workers. Mm -hmm. um, and so like as, as um, companies have shipped their, you know, like, their production overseas, those companies could have been bought up by the state and and run by the workers, but instead they shut down. They the, these cities lost thousands of jobs every single time, and they got moved to a place where people are paid lower, where there's less um, benefits and uh, worse environmental and worker protections. And we've seen. I mean, if we just look at like the kind of mass ordeal, like, yeah, the US doesn't produce things anymore. So we depend on places uh, like China and Korea and India to bring us those goods. And so if anything shuts down in those countries, we're out of luck because we don't have, we don't have um, sovereignty. Uh, we don't have economic sovereignty from these other kind of other nations. And we know that it's put a lot of people out of work across the Rust Belt, across Appalachia, and what is left for us who aren't in the professional class, I mean, I guess maybe I shouldn't say us, um, is, you know, jobs at Walmart and Amazon um, shipping the goods that were made in other countries that will eventually be taken by um, drones and, you know, like factories that are filled with um, robots and, you know, grocery store jobs, which are essential as we know. Yeah, um, essential, but not, not paid. Yeah, the sacrificial. Yeah, yeah, sacrificial martyr job. Yeah. Um, so I guess that, that brings to mind one more question that I think I might want to try to reel back to some of the original things that we wanted to inject into this conversation. Um, but what, when I think about um, this idea of unions, uh, or sorry, um, of like government buying up businesses that go belly up and then giving them to workers. Um, let's let's say that we find a way to do that. Let's say that like the prosperity package, the resiliency package turns into the prosperity package being reinstituted and we start thinking through 
um, some of these like creative ways to like fundamentally start building an economy that really works better for workers in town. Um, and, uh, and then um, a business does go belly up, you know, and, and there's like a fund there in place to kind of take it over and hand it over to workers. Um, given that we live in an at-will state, um, and so this is assuming that we can find a way to legally do this without getting you know, sued and shut down by the state, <laughs> um, which I'd like to think there is. Usually we find a way if we continue trying hard enough. Development authorities. Yeah. Yeah, development authorities, right? So we have a cooperative downtown. development authority, right? Right, downtown development um, authority can buy any business downtown they want. Yeah. Um, and this is where I've been, up until a couple of weeks ago, I've been talking about the economic development department as being the mechanism for this. And I think now I'm learning that technically we would actually need to set up a development authority, which might mean just getting rid of the EDD and making a new development authority or maybe keeping the EDD and then adding development authority on top. Um, what has the momentum currently is the development authority that they're talking about setting up right now in response to COVID-19. So, so potentially that, because that's set up to be countywide, could evolve to be uh, oriented toward co-ops, right? Uh, I actually don't know how much you can uh, change the the charter of a development authority, whether once it's established versus how uh, it, you can otherwise. establish it, as I understand, for by ordinance for anything that that you you uh, that's not illegal. Yeah, yeah. And so then we get into this question of how do we make sure to do that in a way that doesn't violate some of the state's regulations about being an at will state, right? Well, so um, at will doesn't 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 mean that or a right to work state. Sorry. No, right to work doesn't mean you can't unionize. Exactly. That's the thing that's often misunderstood, right? It, but it does mean that you can't mandate a union. So we'd have to make sure that we set up a development authority right. in a way if that... You, is setting up a, a co-op is not the same as setting up. Setting up a cooperative business is not the same thing as setting up a union, though. That's, that's true. I guess I, I just totally forgot that legally those aren't <laughs> seen as the same because we were just talking about how we see them as the same. Yeah. It's um, like, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so, so let's say we start incubating co-ops, right, through our development authority, the, the Athens Cooperative Development Authority, the ACDA, right? It's off the ground. We're incubating yep. some co-ops. Uh, I think of Ovita's question again of like, well, how do we ensure that the kind of businesses we're investing in, we're investing this like collective county money into a smaller micro collective of people doing work. Um, what do you imagine needs to be in place to ensure that those collectives are, are operating in a way that's in line with justice, especially when we start thinking about the other two concepts that we've yet to dig into as explicitly, so this oh, might yeah. also provide a good segue. When we start thinking about feminism and abolition, um, which of course for you I know, hopefully for everybody, but definitely for you as you write about it is like completely overlapped with like racial justice. We start thinking about the context of the South and especially in Athens. Like, how do we make sure that we're we're not just basically getting a bunch of white money invested in a bunch of like rich white people having a cooperative jeweler, you know? <laughs> I mean, that that is a uh, that is a concern. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think that you would need to set up a set of standards, uh, like you know, minimum $15 an hour pay wage and, um, or like living wages up to, you know, like living wages at a minimum with the standard being 15. Um, and you would need to set up like standards for what type of cooperative business, like what the model looks like or, mm -hmm. and or have like, someone who works with the person trying to start it to set up the, how they're going to do the cooperative and then have someone oversee is this does this fit our standards and then say if it does then say yes to giving them the money mm -hmm. and with the understanding that this is the standard that this business works under um so basically having like a, a basic criteria that uh, business is required to have in order to get that funding to incubate that. Yeah, 
And, and then how do you, what do you imagine the accountability mechanism is to make sure that they're adhering to it once they're off the ground? Because that's something I've heard from other folks. I had a great conversation with Ted Terry talking about how we can do some of these things for uh, affordable housing and talking about like land banking. And that's kind of a similar model for getting, uh, like investing in uh, property that's then turned into affordable housing. Um, and you can you can mandate things through a land making program that you can't otherwise in the state of Georgia. Um, but then there's this big question around accountability and how do you ensure that it stays that way a year later, 10 years later? I mean, I think you just have a contract where the money that you've given them to start this to start this cooperative, like if you don't abide by the standards that are put in this contract, the business is ours. Okay, so like built into the contract is like a a takeover if necessary by the local government again. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow, this is this goes so many fascinating places that I'm not sure we have time for. Because then I start <laughs> thinking about like then you got to make sure that you don't write things in a way that lets uh a, like a bunch of capitalist conservatives win election and then like steal the business. Get rid of all the yeah. Steal well, the it would have to yeah. be like. It would have to be like, I would imagine it would have to be like the workers would have to like, like 75% of the workers would have to say like, this business is not operating under the conditions that, that we, that we, that were set up for this business. And then, and it should be taken, taken back to the state only to be, to be reorganized, not to be owned and sold yeah so ideally there's something like a worker center where people can bring those grievances to yeah. um and yeah my my parting thought on that topic and then i know we talked about an hour are you cool with going a bit over that so we can get yeah, to sure. a couple of the other things you want to talk about um but uh what i think of like the money for incubating being a good investment and making sure that like, there's like a sound structure in the beginning that balances the power, the decision-making power and the economic power of all the workers involved. And I kind of think of that as being like, more like a grant or a no, or maybe we have to argue for low interest. I, I like the idea of a no interest loan um, to, uh, actually, I think probably a no interest loan is the best way to go if I'm thinking on the fly here. Um, so then the money comes back into the community um, once that business is off the ground. Yeah to incubate another yeah. Yeah. um similar to like the rolling jubilee for debt uh acquisition but um so we, we give these no interest loans say to the business and it's off the ground and then hopefully you have a strong enough democracy built into the workplace that then it kind of runs itself um but i i'm cautious of like centralizing the accountability on any single authority um including like the local government um, for a variety of reasons that I'll avoid elaborating on now, but um, I have one specific question for you, and then I'd like to bring us back to this kind of three-part socialism, feminism, abolition thing. But when you talk about a worker center, um, and I've heard a lot of folks talking about this, it's felt to me unclear how it's distinct from the Department of Labor. Hmm. Although we know, of course, that the Department of Labor, especially in Georgia, is not doing a lot of the things that we're talking about this worker center is doing. Um, but when people start talking about um, like a place for workers to go to exercise their rights or to seek uh, employment and things like that, some of those things are things that are already done by the Department of Labor. Um, so I'm just curious if you have thoughts on like where is there intentionally overlap between the two because the theory is that the worker center will do it better or are there things that you see as like distinct that the Department of Labor does and then the worker center is sort of filling in the gaps? Yeah, I think it's definitely an overlap. Um, so um, I base my understanding of what a worker center is off of the one that I was work organizing in, in Syracuse. And so they do, they do like education on how to um, ask for your pay when it's stolen, how to ask for your stolen wages in English and Spanish. Mm -hmm. um, they, they organize with um, uh, dairy farmers across New York and um, they help people make claims and they help people apply for jobs. 
So the Department of Labor can't assist you in applying for a job. So somebody who has the skills of a um, janitor or a cook or a bus driver might not have access to the internet or computer or know how to fill out these forms online. And that puts a barrier between them and being able to get a number of jobs that they're qualified for that the Department of Labor is not able to help them with. And so if they don't, like maybe they can make it to the library and fill, but they still might not know how to use the computer. And so like that gap is filled by somebody who just staffs a worker center. And um, the worker center in Syracuse was just like, um, had computers. It also worked as an organizing space. It was a, it was a pretty, it was like a really beautiful space that was like filled with lots of art. And um, it, there was like a lot of organizations that would um, have access to that place and um, had like group meetings there. Um, so it, so it, it, it's kind of an incubator. It's like a place for workers to organize. It's a place for people to not have to go, you know, the Department of Labor is a bureaucracy that is hard to navigate. It's like confusing. They always want you to go online and just do it yourself and fill out the forms. Mm -hmm. So this is like somebody who's gonna hold your hand through the whole process and reassure you as you're, as you're trying to get your claim. But they also did protests outside of um, restaurants that stole people's wages. And Department of Labor is not gonna do that. So like organizing people to get their wages in a multitude of ways, because, you know, like there are more wages stolen than there are property stolen. But clearly we have a whole, you know, police apparatus mm -hmm. based in, in jailing and finding people who steal property and a very ineffectual um, Department of Labor to get people's wages back to them. Mm -hmm. And to take that abstract and make it personal, like I, I wrote about this in the flagpole questionnaire when they talked about what we can do to support artists and local businesses. And I, I, I actually tried to take the focus on like workers and workers' rights because you know the artists and musicians in town are like usually working a lot of these service industry jobs where I mean it's it's definitely not just the service industry, but we have a massive mm -hmm. service industry in Athens and there is tons of illegal activity happening there. And I'm not just talking about like people doing cocaine in the walk-in freezer. Um, there is a lot of people in ownership and management that are like abusing or stealing money from their workers. And I've seen it happen countless times. Literally a majority of the jobs I've held in this town have had elements of that. And I've, I've dealt with having like, like I would get handed my envelope of cash for pay at the end of the week and it just didn't match all the hours I worked. You know, getting paid like $9 an hour or something in the first place. And um, I, uh, I think it's really important that when we're talking about all this stuff that we start building a culture of, uh, like I, I think a lot about how like the Me Too movement and just like the push for like a consent culture um, has has really like brought out into the open the reality of like sexism and sexual violence and harassment that exists in our culture. Um, and I kind of feel like we need something similar for workers where there's just like a lot more testimonies of like, mm -hmm. I worked at this place and they stole my wages, you know, like I like like people telling their story more. And so I don't know how much this happens out of a worker center versus just like a the way we approach like our culture of worker activism. Uh, but I know in my experience here, there's been a lot of reluctance at having like a call out culture against businesses. And that it's that the strategy has been more about trying to promote businesses who are doing things well. But part of the problem is that there just aren't that many businesses that are obviously doing things well. <laughs> um, Sorry. And that doesn't mean that a lot of businesses aren't, you know, I think it's likely that most businesses are. It's just that we don't know and there's not really a good mechanism for knowing. Mm -hmm. And I kind of think that what we need is acknowledgement of people who are doing it wrong um, to then kind of make self-evident who's doing it right, which would be a shift away from what I've seen happen in town so far. Uh -huh. um, and 
so maybe that can segue into the next part. And I do want to say I realized that I wasn't seeing people's comments on my phone because I'm this is a whole new approach to uh, doing these kitchen table chats where we finally got Zoom working to live stream. Um, but I, I had to refresh. And now I realize that there's just like way more comments here than I'm going to get to in real time. So I just want to thank everybody for their feedback. It seems mostly like it's kind of dialoguing. There's some sharing of links, which is wonderful. Um, I would love Celia. Yeah. Could you link? What's the name of that worker center in Syracuse? Is it the Syracuse Workers Center or is it? Yeah, Syracuse Workers Center. Celia, could you link that in the chat? Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think of like what is a we've talked plenty about socialism, so obviously that's informing this, but like a feminist abolitionist approach to worker organizing that involves like telling it like it is, like really describing the current situation for what it is in terms of labor in our community. I haven't much thought about this. Um, well, great. I feel like- I love the unrehearsed parts of our conversation. <laughs> I feel like unionizing is really masculinist. It, 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 there's a, there's kind of this like divide of like, if we think about feminisms, like one of, um, one of their central themes is talking about the divide between public and private and how the economy is in the public and the home is in the private. And so women's issues are kind of relegated to uh, the private. And so this public, the unionizing has always been really masculinist and um, the like women's work of, of, of home care, um, all of the, the like second shifts, um, cleaning and um, cooking, um, all, of, all of that and like, and care work and raising of children, all of that needs to also be considered, that needs to be paid that needs to be unionized, that needs to be taken out of the home and done individually and put into collective work spaces um, so that it can be shared. Um, I think those are the kind of opportunities. I mean, one of the things that people talk about here um, is that we don't have like universal pre-K, which I mean, the the, op the universal pre-K is always like, oh, well, can we pay, how do we pay for, you know, low-income people's like pre-K so that they can go find jobs? It's like, well, we could also support pre-K businesses, cooperatives, so that people can collectively um, do this work without having to um, pay a business, you know, that like overcharges for care and underpays work. like childcare and pre-care childcare is some of the lowest paid work and some of the most important years of people's lives. Mm -hmm. And so like supporting um, women being able to start cooperatives that um, provide those services that people don't have, I think is one way of looking forward to a like feminist way of understanding cooperatives and unionizing. Yeah. I I love every time we talk, there's some new idea that I walk away with and I'm like, that's that's the idea to run with. <laughs> and so this is the first time I've thought about the idea that incubating costs on the local level could be specifically for pre-K. But that like like why not have the first co-op project be a, a child care center. Right, yeah. Amazing. And like yeah. it's like such a it, good idea. And <laughs> since just, we're building a library right now, or have you, do you know but, of other I said, did you just kind of come up with that right now? I know you said that you were you hadn't thought about this yet, or no, or, I have thought about it. it. It just took me a second to to pull all the ideas yeah. together. I think that also like with the library that's being put on the east side, like why not have space for mm. pre and and teaching and learning and in like an office space there that people can can use as well as the um i mentioned this at the uh housing meeting with the director of of uh of whoever's directing the the 
the Bethel redevelopment. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what they call that side of town. They have like a particular name for it, but like the Bethel, Bethel Midtown. What? The Bethel Midtown. I think is what they're calling it. I don't or... think they called it Midtown, but no. it, Bethel was definitely in the name. But the the Bethel redevelopment um, space. I was talking to the person who's um, directing it, and I was like, there should be a space for for um, for care work. And they were like, well, we're not in the business of raising, you know, of doing that. And I was like, no, you don't, I'm not saying you should be in the business of it. I'm saying you should, when you're building this building, there should be space so that people can use it in that way. So that mm -hmm. like, when we talk about like, oh, these people can't get jobs because they can't afford, um, they can't afford childcare. Well, there are places where people can't afford childcare and they're still able to work because they have their parents living in their home and their parents provide childcare or their, or their aunts provide childcare or there's groups or they drop off their kid over at, at so-and-so's house, right? Like that is a way to provide childcare without having to pay companies that don't even pay their workers fair wages thousands and thousands of dollars. Yeah, I love the idea of like this intersection of feminism and looking at childcare as the focus and socialism and thinking about this kind of like basic maxim of it takes a village. Mm -hmm. And like I think of socialism as just extrapolating that out to the grander scale and saying that like there's this like it takes a village mentality to how we take care of each other as a society. And so specifically with like child care that the individualized approach that's so typical in in our like capitalist american society is is actually pretty at odds with like human nature when we think about how most people are accustomed to identifying with a phrase like it takes a village you know well it's like that's kind of what it means to organize our economy and our society's resources around these big systems under with a socialist lens right is to mm -hmm. is to share that labor out um and and I like that you point out how much this is where the local government really comes into play. Like infrastructure says so much about how that looks, right? Like just literally how you build your buildings and whether there is space for that to happen. Right. Uh, kind of dictates whether we're like siloed or not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, or if there's like collective space to even be in. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what was, I was just saying, like there's the old Hillsman school just sitting empty. I've, I've mm -hmm. like, what is going on? Like, why, why is that space being fully used? And if not, why not? And how yeah. can we use it? Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, to go to like in district six and we talk about the mall and how to redevelop the mall and like, Maybe my dog for a second. Um, I love the idea of a, a, a giant, space like that being redeveloped in a way that is multi-purpose that it's not just thought of as like a bunch of different types of businesses that are there but it's that that it's actually a place where there's uh all different kinds of human activity so maybe you have like co-housing maybe there's a workers center there um maybe there's like recreational space or a rec center and also yeah like building in like a child care component you know i feel like too often if we if we marry two aspects of human activity, it's like something plus leisure and that's it, right? So there's like commerce plus leisure, or there's residential plus leisure. You know, we're very accustomed to having like green space, leisure space mm -hmm. built into a development that's otherwise kind of single purpose. But to really think of like the human experience as like there's all these things going on and we should be building our structures or repurposing our big pre-existing structures, things like the mall, mm -hmm. um, or or that the Hillsman school that you're talking about, to be um multi-purpose um as well as of course like thinking of, of like serving different classes so not just multi-purpose for rich people um so i think we should probably wrap up soon but i did want to get to one last thing because i feel like we haven't talked about it too explicitly and your website is abolition is for everyone yes and and i love talking about abolition but when i think of a word that might be even more inflammatory for people than socialism <laughs> uh, abolition might be the one you know so but abolition has only the idea of abolition has only brought great things 
yes, please go on. Let's hear it. Right? Let's like hear abolition it. brought like the end of slavery. Yeah. Abolition, just like closing down prisons and getting people out of out of jails and prisons. Um I I don't know any other movement that that critically uses abolition in that way, but like <sighs> like yeah those those two it's like abolition stop it my dog likes to attack my feet it's very annoying um <laughs> yeah i mean i can't yeah abolition is 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 great i don't know why anyone would be really just like reactionary against abolition even so against like the idea of emptying jails now emptying emptying them to do what is is usually the question I have, but yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I guess maybe to, as two people who already resonate with the, the term abolition, I'm trying to think through questions I've heard from people about like, well, what do you, what do you mean by abolish prison? You know, what do we do with blank, right? Because usually like, what do we do with people, people who are, who are violent in some way? Yeah, it's totally an, it's totally an extension of the those people mentality, right? Um, so my response to that usually is that like, well, when we talk about like prison abolition or say police abolition, it's that we're really talking about building something so fundamentally different that it's useful to call it a whole new thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's not that we don't have people doing some of the same stuff police currently do. No. It's not, it's not that we don't have a place. That was a note to the dog, right? Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that just felt like a wonderful dramatic negation. No, <laughs> no we've arrived at this point and you're so wrong. Yeah, that'd, be a, right. that'd be an exciting way to conclude this chat. Usually uh, when I'm in these Zooms, I just mute so that I can say no to my dog as many times as necessary because <laughs> we're in a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, where was I? Oh, like that we built something uh, so fundamentally different that it's useful to call it something new. And so it's not like we don't have people who do something like what police do in some ways now, but that's why I talk of it a lot as like rethinking policing as social work. That 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 the people who we currently call police, uh, there are people doing a similar job and that they show up in crisis situations to try to help people find a way forward that's safe. Uh, what they do that's fundamentally different is they're not surveilling and arresting and fining in the ways that they are now, that they're not trained in a series of violent tactics and instead are trained more in like nonviolent de-escalation things. And that they're not like the entry point to funnel people into a prison system that we're also seeking to abolish where people are locked in cages and only let out to do labor for free. And we do that in record number in this country and in record number in this state within this country. Um, so like, I'm curious, that's my take, right? But you're the one with abolitionist for everyone is the website and you've actually been a big influence on me, like really owning abolition as like a term for things more broadly, like not just about specifically prison or something, but like a, kind of a mindset in how we go about the world. Um, so I, I'm just curious if there's maybe like a couple of concrete, um, things you can think of that you would apply the concept of abolition to uh on on the local level right we want to take an abolitionist approach to local government what does that look like haven't thought about it on the local level but i can um think of a fly so the way that i like to define abolition which um there are there are a multitude of ways to define it i i look at the first abolitionist movement um particularly on my website thinking thinking about slavery um, and that abolition movement as one that ending the systems that keep us unfree. Um, so that's like very broad. So that can like, that can be looked at as a lot of things. And so for me, um, locally, the first thing is the jail, right? So the jail and the prison are holding people. Many in the jail are being held pre-trial. So they're not even they're not even in the criminal processing system considered guilty of any crime. They're also holding people for ICE detention, also not guilty of any crime. Um, they're also, so, I mean, those are three institutions right there, ICE, mm -hmm. police, 
and the jail. Um, so the first the first question people say when you say like abolish the jail and I'm and then the fourth one of course is police. Abolish the jail, abolish the police. What do we do with what do we do with violent people? Mm-hmm. Well, the first thing I <laughs> It's like, what do we do with violent people as if there is no other process for violent people besides putting them in jail, right? Like putting people in jail doesn't stop violence, right? It, it moves it to a place where you can no longer see. Um, and it also assumes that there's such a thing as violent people, that people are like characteristically that and that's what defines them and sort of ignores the contexts in which behaviors can occur and also the like malleability with which people are not always violent even though they might have been violent in a given situation Mm -hmm. and sorry not to derail you but i just kind of thought that was worth pointing out right and the then i usually tell people is that like prison makes nobody almost literally almost nobody better Mm -hmm. so to the idea that there are violent people and let's be clear, like 1% of all, of all crime in the, and, uh, or I think it's somewhere like 1% of all the people in prison are like there for violent crimes. So um, when we say like, they're there because of violence, there's also like, what is violence? Like, Mm -hmm. is what is like taking someone's home violent? Because none of the people on Wall Street who were doing fraudulent activities that meant millions of people lost their homes. Like to me, like that's violent, right? Like people not being able to eat, um, you know, 31 days out of the month uh, for their entire lives, that's also violent. And like, we don't, you know, we don't charge capitalism as violent. And so like these people who have lived in violent systems who then go on and produce violence like one that is just you have to end the systemic violence if you want to end violent behavior Mm -hmm. and then also you have to deal with masculinity and patriarchy and it's like and the kind of like closed off ways that people without political and economic power are able to feel powerful through um through violence Mm -hmm. if you want to end violence but i i would say that people who are for jails don't want to end violence they want to punish people Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think that's that's true and um that, that that seems true to me um and yet that doesn't seem to be if we just say that to someone who says well, no, that's not what I want to do. They, they kind of make this like safety argument. They often tie it into some of the very things we're talking about, you know, that like we, we have this problem of patriarchy. And so we need to lock away the rapists and the abusers, you know, that we have this uh, problem, this culture of abuse. And we need to lock away people who have like hurt children, you know, and, and so it starts to kind of tap into the same things. I, I feel um, that, that we are also working to transform out of. Um, what I like about the, the way you describe abolition is that, and you're doing this a bit here, but I've heard you describe this to me before now as like, it's a way of, go, of going about our daily life that sees our like interactions with the people around us and the systems we're a part of through like a different lens. Mm-hmm. And so maybe as like a, um, a parting thought, because I think we, we got to go here, um, is do you have like a when you imagine like going about the world and we're bombarded with all this like really heavy ugly difficult stuff you know um like how what does an abolitionist approach look like for you on just like a day-to-day basis like going about your life um so i think i'm getting like closer and closer to like afro pessimism Mm-hmm. which um they said with a smile <laughs> yeah. i know it totally fits exactly who i am and uh to me it's like afro pessimism is like an abolition to go through the world like with an under it's it's really yeah it's really depressing but that 
to like understand the like levels of violence that are being produced and the levels that will have to be taken to to end it so that like that's why I'm like oh the DSA that's great but like we're gonna need more than that mm -hmm. right because like the levels of like of inequality and violence that's being produced and sustained is is like just like everywhere in every interaction that like if when you notice it one it will make you like you know rage but also that like that leads to one an instability it just is it's not going to be able to um it just is it's an unstable system mm -hmm. in that way and that like the levels to change the levels that people are going to have to go to change it are are probably broader than our imagination well that is a, a fairly you know it is indeed a pessimistic way to end uh, <laughs> so i guess i'm i now feel inclined to maybe ask one more follow-up which is tonight uh, despite recognizing all that you get up and go each day mm -hmm. right and you and you choose to spend time talking about this stuff with, with folks like me and, and many many others and to write and everything so what motivates you to do that while having that afro-pessimist lens um i think that Oh, not to be cliche, but like people are waking up to the reality that like we are living in a system that is just like made to produce inequality and wealth. And um, like being someone who has thought about this for the last 10 years, um, I think it's important to be in part doing political education because people are just waking up with that reality like yesterday. And it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's concerning and it's uh, anxiety inducing and it's like destabilizing. And I think people are going to be reaching out to like, how do I understand this moment? And I think people like us who've been thinking about this for a lot longer need to be like, there are answers, there are ways to the future, you just have to be willing to destroy the one you have right now. All right. Well, with that, I'm really glad to be here with you virtually right now, but also generally, you know, day to day and in the struggle. And uh, thank you so much for taking a bunch of time out of your day to, to help make this go and yeah. for sharing your, your thoughts and wisdoms and insights and ideas. So. Yeah, it was a great conversation. Heck yeah. Um, well, let's do it again sometime. I'm thinking about maybe trying to do uh, like panels here and there now that we've got this Zoom thing working, you know, so maybe we can get you and yeah. a couple other radicals to kind of talk about stuff. <laughs> I'll just, I'll lob some softball questions at you and then dig in here and there. Um, does that sound like a, a pretty good idea, maybe? Yeah, it does. Uh -huh. It does. Thank you. Cool. Um, all right. Well, thank you everybody for listening and hanging out with us and asking questions and sharing thoughts earlier. Uh, next time, I'm going to try to work through the engagement with the chat better. I was thrown off by not being able to see it on my screen like I'm accustomed to by doing it our old way. So uh, we will, uh, we'll, we'll one day we'll synthesize all the best parts of this live stream thing, probably just in time to then start having in-person town halls again. But <laughs> onward we go. <laughs> Thank you, Rochelle Berry, and thanks everybody. Have a wonderful Sunday. Yeah. I'm gonna awkwardly stand in front of the screen until I figure out which button to push to end the live stream. So you just I click I, leave I, meeting. I do it from Zoom. Okay. Does that save it on Facebook? Hopefully. Yeah. Okay. I'm being it, sure. it, it automatically. <laughs> All right. We'll edit this out later, of course. <laughs>